You know, I was just thinking about as we were praising him, we're praising him, but you know what? We're about to see some mighty things that I think we're going to be just, this roof is going to be going off in praise because we are so, so close, so close. So I thank him. I praise him. I look forward to what we're about to see him do. And I'm so thankful to be up here because any more that pastor spoke, he would have just given you my entire message. (laughs) So if you would bow your heads in prayer with me, please. Father, we come before you just to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for preparing us to receive from you, from your spirit. Let your word come alive with power, Father. Let it touch us all individually in exactly the place and in the way that we need it, Lord. Only you can do that, Lord. You can reach the, the, the recesses of our hearts and our minds and our soul in ways that nothing and nobody else can. So have your way this morning. We give you all of our attention. We give you our heart. We ask that you create within each of us this morning a clean heart and a right spirit, that all the distractions of the day and of the week just pass, and we are attentive to you, Almighty God. Lord, set me down and let your spirit speak. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The title of my message today is Discerning Truth in a World of Lies. We're going to take a look at the prophet Hosea. And Hosea is the first of 12 minor prophets. And they're minor not because they didn't matter or they were insignificant, but they're minor because their writings are much shorter than those of the main prophets. So we call them the minor prophets. But it's no less impactful, no less important. It is the word of God. Hosea lived in the tragic final days of the northern kingdom, and he prophesied in the middle of the 8th century B.C. for at least 38 years, so he had a track record. He was the only one of the writing prophets to come from the northern kingdom, which was Israel at the time. He was charged with giving Israel a call to repentance, and Israel's alternative to destruction was to forsake her idols and return to the Lord. Sound familiar? If you would turn to Hosea chapter 4. Hosea chapter 4. And we're going to go ahead and read verses uh, 1 through 11 and drop down to, uh, we'll, we'll read 1 to 11 right now. Hear the word of the Lord, O people of Israel, and, and substitute for Israel today to, to make it um, personal, substitute in your in your reading of this, America. Hear the word of the Lord, O people of America. The Lord has brought charges against you, saying, There is no faithfulness, no kindness, no knowledge of God in your land. You make vows and break them. You kill and steal and commit adultery. There is violence everywhere, one murder after another. That is why your land is in mourning, and everyone is wasting away. Even the wild animals, the birds of the sky, and the fish of the sea are disappearing. Don't point your finger at someone else and try to pass the blame. My complaint, you priests, or you pastors, or you leaders of the church, is with you. So you will stumble in broad daylight, and your false prophets will fall with you in the night. And I will destroy Israel, your mother, or the whole nation. My people, my people, God's people, are being destroyed because they don't know me. Since your priests, your pastors, your church leaders refuse to know me, I refuse to recognize you as my priests or my pastors or my church leaders. Since you have forgotten the laws of your God, I will forget to bless your children. The more priests or pastors there are, the more they sin against me. They have exchanged the glory of God for the shame of idols. When the people bring their sin offerings or their tithes, the priests or the pastors get fed. So the priests, pastors are glad when the people sin. And what the priests do, the people also do. So now I will punish both priests and people for their wicked deeds. They will eat and still be hungry. They will play the prostitute and gain nothing from it. For they have deserted the Lord to worship other gods. Now, in this passage, we see Hosea calling out the immorality, 
and the idolatry. Verse 1 tells us there was no faithfulness, no kindness, no knowledge of God in the land. It was full of murder. Verse 2 says there is violence everywhere, one murder after another. Now turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 21. 2 Kings chapter 21, and these are all coming from the New Living Translation. 2 Kings 21 verse 1 reads, Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem for 55 years. His mother was Hephzibah. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight, following the detestable practice of the pagan nations that the Lord had driven from the land ahead of the Israelites. So he reverted back to what the Lord had already removed. Verse 3 says, He rebuilt the pagan shrines his father, Hezekiah, had destroyed. His father was a godly man. In one generation, we have, we have him, Manasseh, doing the exact opposite of what God had, number one, already done for the land and what, what he was supposed to be doing as the king. He constructed altars for Baal and set up an Asherah pole just as King Ahab of Israel had done. He also bowed before all the powers of the heavens and worshipped them. He built pagan altars in the temple of the Lord, the place where the Lord had said, My name will remain in Jerusalem forever. He built these altars for all the powers of the heavens in both courtyards of the Lord's temple. Manasseh also sacrificed his own son in the fire. He practiced sorcery and divination, and he consulted with mediums and psychics. He did much that was evil in the Lord's sight, arousing his anger. And verse 16 says, Manasseh also murdered many innocent people until Jerusalem was filled from one end to the other with innocent blood. This was in addition to the sin that he caused the people of Judah to commit, leading them to do evil in the Lord's sight. Now, what we see here is back then, and, and you know, as I was researching and, and studying for this message, there's over 100 passages in the Bible that speak of child sacrifice. And although I was aware that in the Old Testament there was much talk of, of child sacrifice, I had no idea exactly how much. And isn't it amazing how today, and if you don't know this yet, you will soon know, we are steeped in child sacrifice. And I'm not just talking about abortion. There is child sacrifice happening at the highest levels of our government. There is satanic worship going on at the highest levels of our government. And not just our government, but governments around the world. And not just a little bit, but it's pervasive. And that is why God is about to intervene. It has so very little to do with politics. And yet the enemy, the enemy has managed to divide the church, the body of Christ, making half believe you are talking politics and that your politics are racist, evil, um, uh, against gays, against everything that culture and society says is good. And so the divide happens not just in the church, but it's happening at work. It happens in families, neighborhoods. Church is the first and the biggest system that has failed to recognize this. And that is sad because we are supposed to be a body who can discern, discern good and evil, discern the word of the Lord, not go by what we feel, not allow our our ideology, I'll, I'll use that word, not allow our ideology to be based on what our friends say, what our families say, what the news media says, what your church, if, it, if your home church is not this one, says. That is not what sets your personal ideology. It ought to be one thing and one thing only, the word of God. But the word of God has been so watered down. It is it is ineffective, it is rendered ineffective in those churches who do not submit to what thus says the Lord, not what thus I feel, what thus I don't like, what thus I see in my intellect, none of that. And God is not pleased 
with half the church in America. He is not. And he will not allow it to go without some consequence. And some, for some, it's going to be an extremely heavy consequence because we truly are coming to a point. We are so close now to a point where we're all going to meet a crossroad. And that crossroad is that point where you say, wow. And some of us are there. Some of us are. But I know some of us aren't. And more importantly, this word doesn't just go in these four walls. It goes out. And I know many people out there who are going to be caught so unaware because they are so set in a mindset straight from the pit of hell because it agrees with the flesh. And if you, if you really seriously consider the things of God, how much of that, if we're honest, agrees with our flesh? Very little, very little. If he gave us an eraser that we could take some scriptures out and maybe put others in, all of us would have some we'd like to just maybe rearrange a little bit, make life a lot easier on this earth, right? But that's not what it's about. We don't have that luxury. He's God. We're not. His ways have never, ever, 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 ever been our way. Never. His thoughts certainly aren't ours. And he loves with a love beyond our understanding or capability as humans to love. So Israel had forsaken their God and instead worshipped Baal, the fertility God. The most extensive accounts of child sacrifice in the Hebrew Bible referred to those carried out just south of Jerusalem, in a place called Gehenna, by two kings. Most of them happened under Ahaz and Manasseh of Judah. Both priests and people rejected knowledge. They rejected knowledge, and when they reject knowledge, they reject God. Because who gives us knowledge? Who gives us wisdom? It's God. They forgot the law. Whatever is unlawfully gained cannot be blessed. All we need to do is look past, back to the past maybe decade, two decades in America. There's been an awful lot of unlawful gaining going on. An awful lot. And it will neither be blessed nor will it stand. Instead of warning the people against sin, the priests or pastors today encourage people to sin. Now, how do they do that? Well, as congregations grow, and we've seen this around America, as congregations begin to grow, we're all human, and pastors are no different. And so when they feel good about more and more people coming in, and then there's more and more money coming in, and then they realize if they touch on a subject that is a little somewhat sore to the congregation, the people pull back, the money pulls back. So over time, this doesn't happen in one Sunday. It doesn't happen in one month. It doesn't even happen in a year. But little by little, the compromise of the whole counsel of God in order to keep those seats filled, in order to keep the people. There's always, there's always a, a, a small minority who are very vocal who will approach a pastor afterwards and say, I didn't like that message. And when you get bombarded and you are not strong and grounded in the word as a pastor or a preacher, you can begin to, without even realizing, soften it up a little bit because they didn't like it. It's not about what we like. It's about what we need. Ultimately, God made it clear in Hosea 4, he will destroy the unrepentant pretenders, both in the pulpit and in the pews. That's the end game, and we're so close. We are so close unrighteousness and evil and things that go against the word of God cannot stand. They may stand in the world for some time yet. They cannot stand in the church any longer. This isn't my thinking. This is from the word. And those that study the word begin to see this. Those who read the word begin to see God speaking, and we see the parallels. I don't think the parallels have ever been clearer between what happened to the Israelites over and over again when they disobeyed, and what we're about to see happen in America. Because evil has flourished. And why did it flourish? Because we've been busy being blessed and complacent. You know, not necessarily a sin in and of itself, except for the fact in that period of time of being blessed, 
and complacent, a whole lot of evil was railroaded through. A whole lot of policies were devised and not taken through the, the proper channels as Brother Craig talked about earlier. They weren't taken through the channels that are dictated by our Constitution, that safeguard. No, no, they weren't. We had a whole bunch of judges put in place, a whole bunch of unrighteous judges during the eight years of Obama. And we had half the church bowing before the altar of Obama. Now, I get it. I, I would have loved, and I'm white, but I would have loved to have seen the first black president be a godly man. But he wasn't it. He wasn't it. But what? how do you silence the people? If I say that out loud as a white person, I'm racist. Well, you know what? He was half white. I didn't like the half white side of him. Okay? We never talked about him being mixed. We needed to look at him as black so that we could silence anyone that had problems with what he was doing. They didn't really care what we thought about him personally. He didn't care. All he cared and all, all of those ushered in with him, I don't know how many Muslim Brotherhood positions or, or how many Muslim Brotherhood people were given positions, high positions in our government during his eight-year reign. Did the church notice? A few, but not enough to do anything. The LGBTQ, XYZ, JK, all of that skyrocketed under him. Skyrocketed to the point that Christians, Christians were demonized. If a baker did not, in good conscience, because that baker followed the word of God, but if that baker wasn't willing to bake that cake, that baker was put out of business and, and harassed. And her, in essence, their lives were just turned totally upside down and they no longer could make a living doing what they were doing. That was purposeful. He gutted the army. He gutted every, every facet of our military. He gutted them. He replaced them. You know, let's open up the doors for all transvestites to come. Boy, they're going to serve us well. They'll protect us. This was not done haphazardly. This was done with a purpose because there was a long term, and we've heard pastors speak about this, and some people don't want to accept it. But there was a re very real agenda to do destroy America. A year ago, the Lord led us to watch, and we did this on a Sunday afternoon, the, the, the movies by Curtis Bowers called Agenda One and Agenda Two. And they were just talking about the, the, basically the dis destruction of America over a 100-year period because communism began 100 years ago to infiltrate this nation. And it showed that who the guy called um, Saul Alinsky, his his rules of radicals, and, and the things they had to do to destroy the very foundation of our nation. They had to infiltrate families. They had to remove fathers from families. This didn't just happen. This was done purposefully. Watch any TV show. Watch, watch any type of entertainment. And in today's world, men are, are made fun of. Women are told they can do it all. You don't need men. And they, and they demasculate men today. That's not always been the case. But that was designed and purposeful. They had to infiltrate the school system. Our kids today, maybe we don't see it as much right here in, in Emporia. But I guarantee you, in the cities and the states around this nation, kids are bringing home indoctrination. College students are being indoctrinated before they go out to teach. Our churches had to be infiltrated. So communists infiltrated our seminaries as students back in the 60s. I grew up in the 60s. I remember all of the, the Civil War of the 60s in terms of, of um, hippie power and love, you know, love, uh, what is that? Love, peace, not war. Make peace, not war, whatever that was. You know, and the, the psychedelics, all the 60s stuff. And there were, there were riots on campuses. And all those hippies grew up and grew older. And you know what they became? Communist uh, leaders in our government, in our, in our, certainly in academia, in our institutions. We have, we have Christian, founded on Christian principle institutions, especially all along the East Coast, founded on the word of God. Even their emblems stood for God. They are so far from God today, it is unbelievable. There's nothing left to show that God was part of that institution. 
But this was by design. They had to infiltrate these areas. The family, the church, the school system, society through our, through our government. Make government big. Get rid of all evidence that we are a people whose country was founded on Christian principles, on our God who blessed and worked a miracle to create America. Take down the statues. Rewrite history. Let the government, let the federal government dictate what our kids learn. No more independent as it used to be, states and and cities taught our kids. No, now there is a uniform. Common Core came on the scene. That was nothing but but a ploy of the enemy to dumb down our children. And they were continually being dumbed down. And I feel for those who have come through the, through the university and, and through the structure of higher learning today. You're not being taught truth. You're being taught by individuals with letters behind their names, with whoever, however many degrees they have, with an ideology and a purpose to control the way you think and the way you go about living here in America so that their plan can unfold. The Bible says, as Pastor so duly noted in Ecclesiastes 1, verse 9, (laughs) what has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. If not for the remnant, the church in America today would easily, easily be swallowed up by the culture because half of the American church has been. Today, we see pastors across America watering down the gospel so that they don't offend. And just a little compromise here and a little compromise there, there, and the word of God is replaced by the word of man. Pastors and their flock harden one another to sin. It's mutual. Because as the pastor appeases the people, we all love to come here encouraging, uplifting messages. We all love to be validated. And if you're living in sin, you certainly love the fact that you're not being called out for it because you want to stay there. So it's mutual. It's a mutual agreement. But it's a hardening of hearts between, it's almost a a contract between a church leader and the congregation. I won't step on your toes and you just keep feeding me. You know how many churches operate like that today? Not only does the church grow, But some of them actually get elevated and get a position to be seen on television or on the radio. Now they can't shift. Now they must stay the course because I grew this big preaching this way. They love this message. Let me not shift, even if I feel conviction. We're going to see. We need to prepare ourselves. We're going to see many, many church leaders in the very near future taken down because they, too, sold their soul, sold their soul, to keep their status. They turned their heads. They even allowed their churches to be used because the number one industry in America, sex trafficking and and very close abortion, those two things could not prosper, could not reach the, the, the numbers they have without all facets of leadership in America in some form or another agreeing whether it's taking kickbacks or just turning my head like I don't see what you're doing. That's how it's gotten to the point it has. Why do you think they fight so hard? Do you really truly think any politician cares about a woman's health? Do you really think that's what it's about, that abortion must be legal because we must look out for the women's, woman's health? Do you really buy that? No. It's money. It's money. It feeds the evil machine. Pastors overlook or ignore the known sins of their flock while feeding the flock only what they want to hear rather than what they need to hear. And a great many church leaders make provision for some secret lust, be it money, influence, adoration, or even a secret perversion. Given time, any lust harbored in the heart for a believer will destroy Hear me, you may be able to hide it from yourself even. You're so steeped in it, you can, you can justify it enough that it's hidden from yourself. You can hide it from your family, your friends, 
You can hide it from your job. You can hide it from, from the world. But any lust harbored in the heart of a believer will destroy. It will destroy. We serve a holy God, a righteous God, who's very long-suffering. Thank God he's very long-suffering. I'm very grateful for that. I wouldn't be standing here if he wasn't so long-suffering. But do you know how rapidly we're approaching an end? There's not the time there used to be. Those who share in sin will ultimately share in ruin. Unrepented sin, sin that remains because we don't want to let go of it, because we've convinced ourselves it's okay, it's not as bad as such and such or so and so sin, Whatever the reason, as a believer, we are called to lay it all, lay it all at the throne because Jesus paid an exorbitant price for every last sin, even the hidden sins. And what do we do when we don't acknowledge that as a believer and we hold on to sin? That's a slap in the face to our Savior because there is no sin big enough that he can't forgive. So don't deceive yourself there. Far too many pastors and church leaders identify more with the world than they do with the word. And if that wasn't so, America would certainly not be on the brink of destruction. It really, truly, if the church remained a true church, a true body that stood on the word week in and week out, regardless of what the world's doing, if the church in America did that, there are so many things that could not have happened that have gotten us to this place. If the church in America had been acting like the church Jesus commanded it to be in these last days, socialism would never have been able to deceive the masses by disguising itself as a virtuous system. Do you hear how many young people think socialism is okay? They don't know what socialism is. They only know what they're told socialism is. And these people talk eloquently, and they look, they look nice. They look normal. They speak well, and so they buy it. Because that's what matters, the superficial, the superficial things. When, when we're grounded in the word, we know that the, the devil comes and he masquerades as an angel of light. We know that. We know he has one job, to kill us and destroy us. That, that's his job. When you're in the word, you're recognizing that. God tells us to be on the lookout for that. But when you're not in the word, you forget about that. So you just take at face value what comes at you. Turn your TV on, turn your music on, turn whatever, and you're going to be bombarded with the message of the world. Socialism would never have looked so enticing to our young people. It would never been, have been embraced or encouraged from the pulpit as it is today. It is encouraged from the pulpit today. I watched the most sickening is the only thing I can, I can say, the most detestable little clip last night, uh, and I can't even tell you which I was watching, but it was a church, and it was a very, very, very liberal church that I doubt very much Jesus has been in for a very long time because people in their garb, dressed in their religious garb, and they are calling up and welcoming to come forward any families with, and they named them all off, all of the LGBT, everything, you come forth so we can acknowledge and embrace you. And so a parent, a mother comes up holding a baby and brings her little seven, eight-year-old son who is transitioning to a daughter. And they welcome, well, hand a rose to them. This is a church service. Hand a rose to the little one. Give the, the little one a microphone to say, I want to be known as a girl, but too shy to say it. The, the little one didn't do that. So mom did it for them. And then the congregation in unison recited this whole thing. You are safe, and I can't even remember it. You are this, you are that, and we welcome and love you. And it was all in unison. It was so demonic. It was so demonic and heavy. I, I, I just could not believe what I was just watching. And do you know that's not, that's not an isolated incident? And our mainstream, there are a number of our mainstream churches that embrace that. A number of them. We can be in a cocoon sometimes when we just stay in our church or we stay in churches that are like-minded. But there are churches out there in America that have taken their people so far off course, so far. 
Now, the leader of that church is going to be held accountable. But you know what? So was the adult mother who the Lord gave charge over for that child. Equally, equally. If we know the word, these things would never happen in church. Liberal theology wouldn't have stood a chance if the church had stood firm on the word. And if the the church had preached, as Paul declared in Acts 20, the whole counsel of God, not the nitpicking, not the cherry picking or the buffet word of God, but the whole counsel of God. Now listen, when you take a culture which has been indoctrinated over time with a false narrative of history and you combine it with a weakened church, moved more by the traditions of man than by the word of God, you make sin irrelevant, and you make grace an ever-flowing fountain of justification for every kind of evil. That's where we are today. If half the church was less enamored with and influenced by the anti-God culture and more grounded in the word of God, these are just a few proven facts every Christian would discern, and most of you do. One, all mainstream media lies, and all major social media platforms control the information you are receiving today. Okay? That's not speculation. That's not right-wing conspiracy. That's fact. That's fact. Now, most of the liberal side would never know this because they don't get censored. They don't get suppressed. They don't get shut down. And they, right, frankly, they don't care that, that those that speak this do. But I have been censored com- completely. Didn't cuss, didn't call anybody out, didn't do anything illegal. But I spoke what they didn't want heard. And you don't hear things on the news that they don't want you to hear. And when they get their talking points at 4 a.m. in every network, CNN, ABC, CBS, even Fox, all of the major networks get talking points. They are not free to give you the news. They are not free to give their assessment of what happened. They have one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to push the agenda and the indoctrination that comes before them on the paper at all cost. And most of them are are actually compensated quite well for just staying the course and doing that. So they don't want to let go of it because it's lucrative. But gone is any consideration for doing what's right. They're bought. And then people every single day turn on that news and call the others liars because of what they heard on the lying news and think it's all just politics. It is not. The level of lies and disinformation is unprecedented in human history. These are things that go on in third world countries. It's happening here in America, and it's been happening for quite some time now. And sadly, half of America, actually not half of America, though. They want you to believe more than half. But no, there's there's a remnant, a small portion who have who have been duped. And so they're loud and they protest. And then there's the the bot protesters. Big time money comes in from out of our country to stage these protests. And everyday Americans think that's just everyday individuals doing that. They can muster up, you know, a, a, a 50,000 people to destroy a city in less than three hours because they have them on the ready. They're on the payroll. These aren't people on the phone to each other. Hey, we're going to protest. This isn't right. Now, I'm not talking peaceful protests. I'm talking about the destruction we've seen around America. That didn't just happen. That was orchestrated. Orchestrated. People were flown in and bust in to do that destruction. And the rest of us, doo-dee-doo. Google alone has likely influenced millions with its ability to manipulate algorithms, bury truth, and to produce biased search results. You put something in Google that you want to know about, and you will find the Christian or the conservative viewpoint on that buried at the bottom. And at the top of the things to come up that they give you is their propaganda. And some things aren't just buried, they're absent completely. So that you think these are your choices when you do that. Wrong. This is what they want you to know. Media outlets, including 24-hour news stations, newspapers, publishing houses, 
internet utilities, and even video game developers are all owned by only six major corporations. And they have ties to elite globalists. And they have ties to the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, in conjunction with the Democrat Party. You don't have to like it. It's the truth. It is not speculation. It's fact. And that all will soon be brought to the top as well. Media is no longer the watchdog or producer of factual information, but instead controls the information you have access to. All major media sites censor, all of them, and they silence the conservative Christian voice while flooding the airwaves with leftist propaganda. If the church in America wasn't invaded by the anti-God culture, all Christians would know election fraud has occurred for decades now especially in the major cities. But this election four weeks ago was rigged and stolen. If the media did its job, all Christians would know those at the highest level of a number of state governments accepted bribes. And they accepted bribes to use the Dominion machines that were behind the, the election fraud that occurred. Now, this isn't speculation either. And while... Well, God is, going to, God is going to move so awesomely because you, what I watch when I watch reactions, and I'm on social media to see a lot of reactions, especially on Twitter, and there's such mockery going on right now. It reminds me of what it must have been like in Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, we don't care about that. Party on. He won. President-elect. And, and now we can shut them all up. All of this high and mighty self-righteous behavior going on. That Let me tell you, God is not is not pleased with, and God will deal with it, and he will deal with it soon. Why is it taking so long? It's a lot of evil. It's a lot of evil. It is not just evil in America. It is a l evil around the globe. There's evil connections. China and Iran have been completely involved in this election. They helped get these machines in place. And our leadership, not our president, but our leadership, our state governors, you know, Mike Pompeo, who's from Kansas, he met with the governors, I don't know, a year, year and a half ago. And he was trying to let them know, we already know which of you have been in, in cahoots with China. We know. We have it all. So you might want to think about that. And I think he was giving them an opportunity at that point to say, uh-oh, I better pull out. They, they got it. But no. People get used to money. And so what we're finding right now, you know what's going on in Georgia? They have a Republican governor who up to this time seemed to be loved by the people. But him and his attorney general, they were bought. They, at the last minute, were paid to allow these machines to be used because these machines can change votes. And so they were bought, they were paid to do that with the assurance they could stay in power forever, basically. They won't, they won't be removed, so they'll be able to hold their positions. This is what's gone on, and it's gone on in our major cities. And, and some semblance of this has gone on for, for over two decades, but never ever to this. Where did our votes go when we voted? To Germany. Do you know that? You cast your vote, and it went directly to Germany. You don't believe me? Look it up. Our army, our military... I shouldn't say army, it's our military, you know, with special forces went to Germany last week and they got the Dominion machine. They got the big, gigantic thing that is, has all of the information as to how these votes were stolen. So it, the, the evidence is there. You don't hear about it on the news. They don't want you to. And it's going to go through the federal courts. And federal court is filled. President Trump has put in, I believe, over 300 new federal judges now. But there's still Obama holdouts and holdovers. And when it goes before them, they deny it. And that's okay, because the ultimate goal isn't the federal level. It is the Supreme Court. And that's where it's all headed. So watch. Watch and see what God does and how he deals with this evil. But understand that, that the evil is monumental. It is not small potatoes. It is not, when are we going to see these people get arrested if they're so bad? You have no idea. And you know what? None of us have any idea. Because as much as I think I know what's going on, I keep hearing it is 
so far beyond the understanding of most people. It will sicken us as to what's been done to our country. It will sicken us. So we don't even know it all yet. If truth wasn't being suppressed, everyone would know there's 100% proof of our votes that were cast here in America were sent to Germany. Okay. Big government is designed for one purpose only, and that is to take away your individual freedom. The bigger the government, the less freedom you have. That's, that's the bottom line. Gerald Ford, President Ford once said, a government big enough to give you everything you want is big enough to take away everything you have. And that's true. Planned Parenthood gets over $600 million a year from the federal government. $600 million a year. Planned Parenthood. That doesn't plan any kind of parenthood. It's an abortion mill. But what does it do with its money? It turns around and funnels millions back into the Democrat Party. More recently, in the last month, when, when Black Lives Matter arose, there was a, a website for everyone to, to send money, send money. Because don't we all believe Black Lives Matter? Yes, of course. And so we must send our money to, to help this organization without doing due diligence and recognizing that the two founders of the Black Lives Matter movement are lesbian Marxists, and they're avowed Marxists, and you can find the video where they say they are. They are behind the Black Lives Matter movement. And when you donated to Blue something, I cannot remember what the name of it was, those monies did not go. I, I have yet to hear from a black person that, that really, their life was made better by these donations. And over the years, our black cities are not being made any better than they've been. They're just not. Money's never trickled down to the people who need them. Because you know where those monies went? And I mean millions and millions were donated. You could follow that trail, and it was laid out. It goes into the Democrat Party. It goes into those individuals who are trying to get into power so that they can succeed the last person doing nothing for the people as the leader. People don't research. We, we react with emotion. I can't tell you the number of people that have defriended me because I say all lives matter. I'm, I, I'm not going to be swayed by rhetoric or by a demand to be politically correct. All lives matter. If black lives truly mattered, they, our cities, the cities where all of the, the Chicago and all of the gangs that have run, run the, the cities forever are no different than they were 10 years ago. If anything, they're worse. Why aren't we in there? Why isn't some of that money in there to help educate, to help change, change for the people? Why is it during all of these protests, Pete, the Antifa came in and burnt down the very places these black people who have worked their whole lives to build their businesses destroyed? Well, if, if Black Lives Matter so much, why are black Antifa doing that to black people? I saw so many couples crying. That was their livelihood. Why did they come in and do this? But you don't see that. You see what they want you to see. That we are such a racist country. We are beyond racist. We are horrible. And then I laugh at the numbers of white individuals who are falling at the feet apologizing. These white individuals never owned a slave. And the ones they're apologizing to never were a slave. But we have this whole thing going on to keep the spotlight as if that's the problem while we're ignoring all of the evil, all of the corruption that they're actually infiltrating. There are at least five videos that if you truly want to know if Biden isn't racist, there are five videos out of his own mouth. You can go look up and see what he said about black people. But mm, we, don't, we don't bother with that. And just as easily, you can go back and look at all the pictures of our president with black individuals who loved him. Democrat leadership, black individuals loved him until he ran for president. Why? Because while he knew their deeds, he never got sucked up into them. He didn't. They, you, you know if they had dirt on this man, legitimate dirt. You know how they vetted him. You know how they hate him. They'd have it out there. But all you get is lies and smears and, and accusations that never amount to anything because they can't. But suddenly these people that love this man and now on both sides of the aisle hate him. Both sides, Republicans and Democrats alike. Why? 
because what he, the culmination of what is occurring right now, he is about to expose all of their evil. And he's about to expose the world's evil. Now, could this man do this on, him, on his own? Absolutely not. But God's hand is upon him. 17, I think 17, it might be more, uh, assassination attempts thwarted. All of these, I've never known an individual in the public eye so demonized, so hated. And he, they've had four years to take him. They tried starting with the year he was running. They have tried so hard to take him out. But you can't, you cannot curse what God has blessed. You don't have to like him. We've talked before about the kings in the Old Testament and, and the prophets that were told to come Hurry up, deliver the word, and then run because, you know, they weren't the, exactly the most lovable in the flesh type people. Now, Trump, I believe, gets a bad rap because he really does a lot of things that never reach the, the news. Well, they've kept from the news. But people don't know how many individuals he has quietly helped throughout his life. He's a giver. He's a giver. He doesn't take a, take a um, salary. He gives. He's lost over a billion dollars. He had it all. Why would he want to bring all of this on him? Except that he loves his country, and he loves God and his policies. If you don't like the man, take the time before you just spew all of the nonsense at him. Look up the policies. They stand with God. They stand with the church, with Christianity, all of the policies he has put in place. He has taken out more sex traffic offenders than all of the previous three, four, five presidents combined while fighting a cabal of evil. That's God's hand on him. That is God's hand on him. There's evidence that 70% of our government leaders have been compromised and implicated in crimes against humanity. And they don't answer to the American people. They answer to China and Iran. They could care less about us. And they're on both sides, Republican and Democrats. This is a battle between the forces of darkness and good and evil. It's a battle the body of Christ can no longer pull back from or sit on the sidelines. Like him or not, God has positioned this one man, Donald J. Trump, to stand between our freedoms and the complete destruction of America. It's amazing how how naive and how blind so many people are to how close we are to being totally, totally destroyed from within. We are there, but God. Those in the body that are stuck on their dislike of this man because of the way he talks or his personality or because of what they hear on the news, they need to start praying for discernment. They need to start praying because most people, when they pray, they pray according to what they believe. But this is an area where if you want to know the truth in a lying world, ask God. Ask him with no preconceived ideas. As a Christian, go before the Lord and ask. Not ask him to align with your ideology or your belief system, but ask him to show you truth. He promises to do that. And if imagine if the church as a whole, liberal, conservative, just the entire body of people who profess Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. Just imagine if everyone on both sides decided to go to their knees and pray, Lord, show me your truth. I don't want to just hold on to what I believe. I want to know what you say. Show me what's going on. Show me your truth. If we'd have done this in the beginning of all this, we probably wouldn't have been dealing with a lot of the stuff we deal with. But it's not too late. But many people don't want God to show them truth. They want God to show them they're right. And God's not going to do that. He's not going to do that. And there's a danger if you want to hold on to what you think is right or what you believe. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. You don't need to go there, but... It reads, and he's talking about the Antichrist here. He will use every kind of evil deception to fool those on their way to destruction because they refuse to love and accept the truth that would save them. So God will cause them to be greatly deceived, and they will believe the lies. 
Then they will be condemned for enjoying evil rather than believing the truth. We are seeing the forerunner to all of that right now because there are so many deceived and blinded to the truth as to what is happening in the world and in our country. And it's those very ones who at the moment the evidence is going to be so overflowing, God's hand upon this election, Donald J. Trump will and is still the president of the United States, will be reelected, no doubt in my mind, absolutely no doubt in my mind. We will see these things come. But there will be a, a number of people that will not accept it because already the talking points are coming. He's trying to steal it back. It doesn't matter what they say. If people want to believe that, that's what they'll believe. But this is a dangerous, dangerous point for these people right now because we're so close to God giving people over to delusion because they believed not the truth. And if they stay where they are now and don't see it on this scale, they will not see it with Antichrist. They won't. That's just a reality. That's not, you know, decades and decades down the road. No, this is soon. And this right here is a wake-up call to the church. Many, many, many Christians have in the last four years come out, what we call the walk-away movement, um, uh, great awakening. Many have. Many suddenly have seen it because they were willing to look at truth. But there's still many who are so steeped in delusion and so blinded to the truth that they're just angry. They're angry. And God help those who call themselves Christian, who profess Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and do not see God at work, who do not see him move as he's going to move because there's a defining moment there where these people could easily be given over from that point forward to a delusion even stronger that they will never recover from. Those in the body of Christ mocking him are also just in dangerous territory spiritually. They need to repent. They need to repent. You know, the world's going to do what the world does, but the body of Christ does not have the luxury to mock anybody. And there's a repentance that has to happen. For those whose eyes are open, they must repent of that mockery. We're about to see God move upon this country in a way the church has never experienced since the founding days of an America blessed by God. And in 2 Chronicles 7.14, God says, then if my people, my people, the church, who are called by my name, called by his name, will humble themselves, will pray, will seek his face, will turn from their wicked ways or repent. Okay, those were the stipulations that had to happen in order for him to hear, to forgive, and to heal our land. And as Pastor alluded to, on September 26th, a, a huge body of believers came together on the mall, on the Washington, D.C. mall, under the direction, and, and, and I believe Jonathan Kahn was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, an anointed man who called for this time of repentance. And there were thousands there and hundreds of thousands, I believe millions in the Spirit joined in. And we repented. We stood in the gap. We stood in the gap and we repented for this nation. And as as that day progressed, and as those, you can still watch it, it is, it is found on YouTube. As you watch those prayers, you feel God. You feel his anointing. And God was pleased. And so we have the assurance. We now have the assurance by faith that our God, who is not a man that he should lie, but instead a faithful God, he is keeping his promise to America. We will see God move mightily to save our nation. And not to make it great again, but to make it godly again. You see how you were all in my message there, Pastor? <laughs> you said that exact thing. <laughs> and John 8.32 gives us the assurance, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth is right there for all of us to know. We just have to have the desire to know the truth. We have to have the willingness to let go of preconceived ideas. Some of us are brought up in families that we were, ideology was just passed on. We didn't give it a thought. 
We don't have the luxury anymore to say that, oh, I didn't give it a thought. I didn't know. God is telling us. And we're either going to accept it or reject it. But there'll be a price to pay or there'll be a blessing to be had. It's a choice. If you would, stand to your feet. We're going to go ahead and pray. And we're going to pray a prayer for truth. For God to shower us with his truth. And as we pray this prayer, clear your mind, clear your heart of everything. Because this is a very serious prayer that I am, I believe as, as more and more of those who have yet to see truth, more and more eyes are going to be opened as we pray. Because our prayers don't fall flat. He promised he would hear. And he promised he would answer. And so let's not only pray for ourselves. If we're there, great. But think of and pray for loved ones and people you know that need to know truth. Because we're called to stand in the gap for them. Father, we just come before your throne room right now, Lord, thanking you. Thanking you, Lord, that you are our God and we are your people. Cleanse each of us, Lord, from unrighteousness. Create within each of us a clean heart right now, Lord. Renew a right spirit in us right now, Father God. We desire that our prayers, as we lift them up from this house this morning, will not only be heard, but be answered, Lord. We thank you, Father God, that as much as our heart is towards those we know and love who have yet to see truth, yours is that much more so. You love them with a love none of us can comprehend, and it is your desire that none should perish. So today, Lord, this morning, we pray, Father God, for your truth to rain down on every individual, on every household, on every church, in every facet of government, in every part of every city, of every state, all across America, all across Washington, D.C., all across the capitals of every state. Father, your truth, your truth come forth. We decree and declare your truth, Father God. Your truth and your truth only have its way in the hearts of every individual. Not only under the sound of my voice here, but all around, Lord, and in the hearts and the minds of all of those who are teetering right now, Lord, on that fence. With destruction on one side and abundant life and life eternal on the other. It is a serious time in our nation, Lord. It is a serious time in the body of Christ in America. It is your desire that we unite. It is your desire that we be one body of one mind. And that there is harmony, Lord, as we come forth together in the proclamation that nothing else matters but the word of God. The word of God is truth. It is truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody but nobody comes to the Father but through Jesus. So, Lord, today we humble ourselves before you. If there's an inkling of doubt as to what to believe, Father, I pray right now your spirit goes out into this congregation, into every heart, and shows your truth mightily, brings it forth, in a demonstrative way, in a tangible way, that from this morning forward, that individual will know truth and be set free by truth, the truth of you, Lord, the truth of your word. I pray, Father God, for all of those who will listen to this message, who don't know truth, who have been duped by the enemy and his tactics, who have been complacent, who have been ignorant of the word, not been in the word, that they too would feel that pull. They would feel the spirit talking to them to come back into the word, that you would open up your word and make it life to their bones, that you would make it life, Father God, that just shines a floodlight on truth, and that they would rest in the truth of our God, a truth that never changes, steadfast, you are always the same, yesterday, today, and forever. The culture may change. Doctrines may change. Your word never changes. 
and you honor your word above your name. So let your truth fall, Father God, on all of us. Let it seep into the darkest parts of our hearts where we may harbor untruth, where we may harbor sin that we have not even acknowledged. We hand it all over to you this morning, Lord. We give it all up. We leave it all at the cross. And we join with you in anticipation and in excitement about what we are about to see you do in this land. Because you are about to show that you have heard our prayers and that you have answered and that you are in the business of saving our land, Lord. We give you praise, Father God. We give you thanks, Father God. And Lord, let it not be enough for us that we see you do this, but let us go forward with your real desire, which is for revival to be birthed out of making this country godly again. That souls, the great harvest of souls that is on the horizon will be saved because your church is finally standing up. So we thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for loving us like you do. Thank you for showing us truth. Thank you for leading us in the days ahead by your spirit. And Lord, we do look forward to your glory falling. Have your way in our hearts, in our lives, in our households, and in our church. And Lord, we're about to see you do the miraculous in the United States of America. In Jesus' name, we call it all done. And we say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And amen. Amen. Amen.